In this problem, we're gonna be looking at a device that measures viscosity in terms of this plate rotating with some given RPM. So the problem statement says, the figure below is a device used to characterize viscosity of non-Newtonian fluids. That's actually a key phrase to recognize in this problem. It consists of a flat plate and a rotating cone with a very obtuse angle. So that obtuse angle is this right here. The apex of the cone just touches the plate surface and the liquid to be tested fills the narrow gap formed by the cone in the plate. This point right here is the only point of this cone touching this stationary surface and then the fluid is in between the cone and the surface so it's like this area right here. Derive the expression for the shear rate in the liquid that fills the gap in terms of the geometry of the system. Evaluate the torque on the driven cone in terms of the shear stress and the geometry of the system. Okay, the first thing we want to do is actually define Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. So this is a Newtonian fluids. It falls that the shear stress is equal to the viscosity of the fluid times the derivative or basically the velocity profile. So this is Newtonian fluids. Since we're looking at non-Newtonian fluids, the equation changes a bit, but the process of this problem is still the same. It just, you have to account for this extra number. So for non-Newtonian fluids, the shear stress is defined by mu times du dy, which is the velocity profile as it changes with height, to the nth power. So if we look at a graph, so if we look at some sort of graph like this, and we plot the viscosity as the y-axis, and then the velocity profile in the x-axis, a Newtonian fluid will have a linear relationship. So this is Newtonian. However, for non-Newtonian fluids, the equation is not linear. So since this is a, to some power n, uh, that means the equation is some sort of quadratic. So that means it could either be concave down like this or concave up like this. So these are non-Newtonian. So for this problem, we'll be looking at this kind of fluid, which doesn't change the process, but this is the main difference between non-Newtonian and Newtonian fluids. So the first thing to do is actually to define the velocity profile of the system or the fluid that the system has. So if we look at this section right here, so the, this is where the fluid stops in terms of height. So this is how high the fluid goes in terms of the system. And we know that the system is rotating in this fashion. Therefore, the velocity profile must act tangentially to the circular cone of this uh, device. So if we're looking at a top view, the velocity profile at the greatest point, which is right here, must be acting in this direction if we're assuming this rotation. This is the velocity at this given height of the cone. As we get closer to the center of the cone, the velocity profile diminishes. So if this is the center, and then if we draw a vertical line downward, the velocity profile will be something like this. So we can see that the velocity profile is dependent on the radius of this cone. So we'll define that radius right here. So this is some, some arbitrary r, where r is between 0 and big R, which is the maximum radius of this cone. So not only does the velocity profile change in the r direction, but it also changes in terms in the vertical direction. So this direction right here. So if we look at a side view, we also know that it changes linearly as well. So if we look at this, so this is a side view, the velocity vectors will be pointing in or away from you given this uh, diagram. The maximum velocity vector will be right here and we'll say that's going inward, so it goes like that. And this varies as it goes down the incline. So these are all vectors pointing away from you, assuming the rotation is correct. So we can say that the magnitude of the velocity profile is dependent also on the height of this given fluid. So we could define that as z, I guess. So the reason why we want to make these distinctions is that not only does the velocity profile depend on the radius, but it also depends on the height at which uh, the fluid exists. So we know that the fluid actually stops moving at the st stationary point. So the velocity of the profile is zero at this point, and it increases with height 
due to the cone rotating. So that's the whole momentum diffusivity of viscosity in terms of this problem. So now that we have that defined, we can now start defining the shear rate or uh, du dy. That's what the shear rate is. So now we're going to define the shear rate in terms of the geometry of the problem. So we're going to look at some arbitrary right triangle that is proportional to this triangle that defined by big R and the angle theta. So we're looking at some arbitrary triangle from here to here. So we could define this vertical axis as z. So z varies with time. So we're going to call this z. This is some arbitrary triangle within this bigger triangle defined by r and theta. So this would be little, little r, so some arbitrary distance from the vertical axis. And this is going to be theta. So given that, we could define z as r tangent theta. So now that we know that, how do we define the velocity, or u, in terms of this system? So if, if you remember back in dynamics, you can define the velocity of something rotating in terms of its angular velocity. So what I'm saying is that we can define v as omega times r. This is the linear velocity of something rotating. So this v is actually these magnitudes right here given some arbitrary length r. So since we define the velocity in terms of u, we can say this is equal to u. So these are the two equations right here that we're going to be using to define the shear rate. So I'm going to rewrite this equation in terms of r. We're going to solve for r. So r is going to equal z over tangent theta. And then we're going to plug this in to this equation over here. So we're going to get the velocity u equals omega z divided by tangent theta. Now to find the shear rate, all we have to take is the derivative with respect to the vertical axis. In this case, it will be z. So we'll take du dz, which is basically du dy in terms of this equation up here, or actually this equation up here. And then we'll uh, get the shear rate. So the since uh, omega and tangent theta are not changing with time, we're assuming omega is constant and theta is constant because the system is not changing. The parameters of the system is not changing. So we could say that the derivative of u with respect to z is simply omega divided by tangent theta. One thing that the problem does point out is that this cone is very obtuse. So uh, it's very implicit, but what they're trying to say is that theta it can be approximated if we're using some trig function. So if theta is really, really, really small, then by using the Taylor series, we can assume that theta is approximately tangent theta. So this is just a good approximation because we know that the cone is very obtuse, so we could say theta equals tangent theta. So now since we're working with non-Newtonian fluids, we have to take that shear rate and raise it to some power n. So this would be du dy to the power n. So we know du dy is omega over tangent theta, so this is going to be omega over tangent theta to the nth power. So now that we have that defined, we can define the shear stress on the system. So we could say the shear equals the viscosity times the shear rate, which is omega over tangent theta uh, to, to the power n. And we also said theta is tangent theta, so we could say that this equals mu times omega over theta to the power n. So this is the answer for the first part of this problem right here. So our next goal is to actually find the torque on the system. So we're going to go back and look at that top view to define the torque on the system. So this is the top view of the cone, and we know that the velocity profile varies with the radius of this cone. So the first thing I'm going to do is define some arbitrary radius. So we are using cylindrical coordinates for this. So we're just looking at how r, the radius, changes as it moves away from the center of the cone, as well as r rotates relative to some given axis. So I'm going to say this is going to be little r, some arbitrary distance, and this is going to be some angle theta. So we're going to have to create some sort of differential to find the shear stress acting onto the cone and then therefore use that to find the torque on the system. 
So what we're going to do is look at some delta theta later. So let me rewrite that as r, and this is going to be r plus delta r. So what we're going to do is define this length r, and this is going to be some length r right here. So this is going to be r, and this extra bit is going to be uh, dr, or a change in r. So the reason why we want this is so that we can define this area over here, dA. So to define this area dA, this arc length, this is going to be d theta, this arc length right here is going to be r d theta, and then to get that extra distance right here, this is going to be dr. So we could say that dA is just the multiplication of these two values, so it's going to be r dr d theta. So you might remember this in multivariable calculus, this transformation into cylindrical coordinates. That's basically what we're doing. So the reason why we want to find the area is that we could relate the area to a force and then relate a force to a torque. So by definition, um, the shear stress is basically some force, I'm going to give the unit some force, um, so newtons divided by some area, so it'll be some uh, meters squared. So if we want to find the force, we could say that df is the shear stress times an area. So we could say that this equals the shear stress times dA. And if we wanted to find a torque, a very, very small torque, so in this diagram, uh, let's say it was rotated over here, so this area right here has some torque with it, assuming that we're rotating in this direction. This is going to be some small torque acting on the cone. So we could say that this is going to be equal to some length r times that uh, force df. So this is going to be r df. And then by this equation, we can say that this is r times the shear stress times dA. And we know that dA is defined by this uh, infinitesimal right here. So we could say that dt equals the shear stress times r squared dr d theta. So if we integrate that from zero to some total value of the torque, we'll also have to integrate this, which will become a double integral. So this will be some area a. So this is one integral that you can solve to, to uh, solve this problem. And in general, this will work for all problems dealing with uh, viscosity and finding torque on a system like this one. So this will work 100% of the time. However, you can simplify this integral if you recognize the symmetry of the system. So instead of taking a small area dA, we can actually take a little bit larger area, although it's still infinitesimal, due to the shape of the system. So instead of looking at a square area, we can look at a ring instead of that. So we could say that if we look at this infinitesimal, excuse my bad drawing, so instead we could look at a ring that looks like this. So this will be our new dA. So our dA in this case would be the radius or the circumference of the circle times that change in r. So this will be 2 pi r times dr. So another way we could write this integral, and we could say that 0 to t dt, or the torque, is equal to 2 pi times this integral, which is going to be r squared times the shear, or shear stress times dr. And if you do the math of this integral, you'll get the same equation over here. And this will be our limit of integration from 0 to big R. So to prove that, I'm going to solve this integral instead, and you're going to see how this uh, integral pops out from this equation right here. So let me rewrite that integral. So this is going to be 0 to some uh, value of torque that we're trying to find equals the double integral. So we're going to have it as this. So this is going to be the double integral of the shear stress times r squared dr d theta. So our first limit of integration, this integral right here, is dependent on r. So this is going to be from 0 to r, or basically 0 to the full radius of the cone. And then theta is going to be the whole cone, or in terms of the angle, it'll be from 0 to 2 pi. So the 0 to 2 pi comes from this, so we're rotating all the way around the cone, so our limit of integration is from 0 to 2 pi. And then for r, we're obviously moving from the center of the axis all the way to big R. So those are our two limits of integration.
And we also defined the shear stress earlier, so we could plug that in as well. So we're going to get, and the shear stress is actually constant, so we're gonna get mu times omega divided by theta to the nth power, and that's constant, so we can move that out of the integral, and this is gonna be zero to r. So let's solve this integral. It should have been too difficult to solve. So the integral of r squared, that's gonna be one third r cubed evaluated from zero to r, and this is gonna be from zero to two pi d theta. So that's gonna equal zero to two pi, one third r cubed, and I forgot the shear stress, so this will be mu omega over theta, omega over theta to the nth power. And since r does not depend on theta, we can move this out as a constant and integrate this. So this would be mu r cubed over three times omega over theta to the nth power times this integral from zero to two pi d theta. And then this will just equal theta. So this will be mu r cubed to the nth power of theta from zero to two pi. And then we simply rewrite this equation. So this integral right here is simply equal to just T. So we can say that the total torque on the system is gonna equal this. So if we plug in two pi into theta, that's just gonna be multiplied by two pi. So our full equation is two pi mu r cubed over three times omega divided by n, or divided by theta to the nth power. So the reason why this integral right here is the same as this integral over here is because this integral from zero to two pi uh, d theta uh, is simply just two pi. So that's this e right, right here. So we basically solved this, this part of the equation by looking at the symmetry of the problem. So that's why it was pulled out over here and that two pi is still right here. So that's why if you, if you notice the symmetry of the problem and uh, you, you can apply that simple trick so you don't have to do as much uh, integrating, but either way, you will get the same answer. However, if you don't assume the symmetry of the problem, you can apply that to all problems that are, re are sort of related to this type of problem, meaning you have to find the torque or the force on the system given some viscosity of a fluid and you could use that general equation all the time. However, if you want to speed it up a little, a little bit, you could use the symmetry of the problem to make the integral a little bit easier. But this is the problem, or this is the answer to this problem. This gives you the torque being applied on the system due to the frictional force, which is going to be the viscosity of the fluid, or which is due to the viscosity of the fluid. So hopefully that wasn't too complicated. Uh, the hardest part of these problems is actually setting up the problem and understanding what is shear stress and how does the shear stress relate to the velocity profile and how can I relate the velocity profile to the geometry of the system. Once you have that set up, the mathematics is pretty straightforward. You just do a few integrals and you get the solution. So that is it for this problem. Hopefully it helped you and I'll see you in the next video.